say that you've got a dog that sleeps on the ground. We would have just worked from oh. the other side of the room. Right. So you got to, you got to. But if you fire her, you're going to do it. I'm going to go in the middle somewhere. <laughs> and she's dark colored. Good afternoon. I'll call to order the meeting of the New Ulm Public Utilities Commission for the month of July. First item on the agenda is to approve the minutes <coughs> of the last meeting, June 26, 2018. Move to approve the minutes of the regular meeting held June 26, 2018. I'll second. Any discussion on the motion? Uh, we have a motion and second to approve the minutes of the regular meeting held June 26, 2018. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, the next item is to receive the report for utility operations of the month of July. Uh, the employee of the month was Erin Duchene of the Water and Steam uh, Department. Erin has been employed by the Minnesota, by New Orleans Public Utilities since September of 2014. He re recently volunteered to assist the Material Distribution Center and the MDC staff stated that Erin's quick offer to help was of a great benefit to them. He's a member of the safety committee and regularly performs above his expectations and he has currently been working on some metering issues for us. Okay. Thank you, Aaron, then, Employee of the Month. Anything else from the report that you want to highlight? Um, the power plant had a steam acid leak, which several departments worked together to help them repair and clean that up, meeting all their environmental requirements. And other than that, if you have any specific questions, I'll try to answer them. I'll offer the motion to receive an order filed the report regarding utility operation during the month of July 2018. I'll second. Any discussion of the motion? On the motion and second to receive an order filed the report regarding utility operations during the month of July 2018. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. And that motion carries. Uh, next we have a presentation from DGR, DGR Engineering. All right, thanks for having us. Um, my name is Jared Luzzi. I'm with DGR Engineering. I'm uh, accompanied by Chad Rasmussen, uh, of also of DGR Engineering. We uh, work together with the New Alm staff to develop a uh, electric system study covering a 20 year, 20 year period and a capital improvements plan. So I'm here to report the results of that and to answer any questions that you guys may have. Sure. Easier. Yeah. Yes. And if there's any additional copies needed, you just let us know. We can have some produced. Or mm -hmm. Right. Brief introduction. Um, this is a system evaluation and planning study for uh, the electric distribution system, which encompasses uh, transmission system, the substations, electric distribution system, and a general look at the generation capacity. Um, the planning covers a 20-year period in terms of how far we look out for load growth, um, and I'll touch on that a little bit more. And ultimately, what we go for is to develop budgetary cost uh, for planning, for planning the infrastructure in the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, basically, our scope to assemble this report and some of the legwork, I'll just briefly describe this. Um, start off with collecting a bunch of data, working with the staff here having a few kickoff, a kickoff meeting and additional follow-up meetings to discuss some of the preliminary findings. Um, ultimately, we work to develop a load growth model or a load flow model that we can uh, analyze the electric distribution system voltage and capacity. Um, in that assessment, we determine deficiencies and based on those defi deficiencies, we design a number of uh, 
projects that will address those deficiencies to uh, harden the system or keep the system successful and efficient as it has been. So, uh, the culmination of this is a capital improvements plan has its fairly detailed est cost estimates that are for you guys' purposes in, in budgeting. Briefly mentioned that uh, we only covered New Ohm's, New Ohm owned facilities. So like I mentioned, the transmission substation distribution system and a brief look at the gener generation capacity, not in-depth look because it's slightly separate issue, but overall just the New Ohm the facilities that NUPU owns. So to kick off everything, we obtained uh, New Alms GIS data system. Um, we developed our distribution model where we could model different aspects of the system, different scenarios, different load conditions. Uh, we developed a one-line diagram to, or we obtained a one-line diagram that was existing in did some, had some updates made to it and uh, included that into this study as well. Um, here's an example of a system map, map we put together with the, uh, with the GIS data. It was a fairly smooth transition. Um, appreciate the staff's help uh, in obtaining that information. Here's an example of a one-line diagram the one-line diagram referred to in the report shows a basically a connectivity between the facilities. So it's not a good uh, graphical or physical representation, but it's there to reference um, where things interconnect, and we'll, it's easier to show some improvements on the one-line versus the overall system map. So, in in establishing the load analysis base for the study. Uh, we looked at the existing historical peak demand over the last 10 years. Um, we obtained records, historical data. Um, over the last 10 years, it's obvious that New Alms is summer peaking load. So generate uh, the, the, the peaks are attained through elevated air conditioning uh, during the hot summer months. Uh, we had a high of 48 and a half megawatts in 2011, but in general, the average peak was around the 45 megawatt range. Um, what we used as a baseline in modeling the existing system was re uh, recently 2017 in July, where that baseline peak uh, we use when I refer to the existing system, that is the peak load that was realized at that time and that's what we're basing the, the baseline off of. Um, when developing the projected system load model, we, uh, we had a meeting with the staff and we talked about any upcoming uh, business or commercial industrial developments that might be on the horizon. <coughs> we talked about some existing large power consumers that have potential to expand where they're located and we come up with a general idea of how much growth could happen in the next 20 years. So uh, get out the crystal ball, look at that a little bit. Um, it's a little bit of guesswork, but we, we do our best to get kind of input from the staff that are on the ground in the field that have a, a, you know their ear to the ground to where uh, load is actually going to be realized on the system. So between uh, residential, commercial, and industrial growth, we, uh, and also just general system growth on the existing system, just people using more power where they're at over the next 20 years, we developed a, about a 1.5% uh, growth average over the next 20 years. Um, and primarily a lot of that being in the northwest industrial area of the system, or, or so, we, so we're calling it in this report. 20-year growth total equates to about 17 megawatts over the next 20 years. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a value that we picked that will give us some uh, ability to really kind of map out a, a long-term plan in terms of allowing for some flexibility in there uh, so, so we can 
get an idea what what big time improvements need to be made to accompany that load. And in 2038, in 20 years, that peak is about 63 megawatts. So, so does uh, you know? I keep reading about all the electric cars and electric trucks coming. <coughs> Um, I forget what the expectation is by 2030 on number of vehicles that are going to be electric powered. Does, I mean, do you guys have any thoughts about that? Is that factored into the presentation? Is it even significant? That, that could be significant. I mean, that, um, crystal ball, though, is up the hill. Um, how that's going to play in, but it, it could be, it could be very impactful. Um, one of the, the challenges with that too is when people are going to charge their cars you know, up at five o'clock when they get home from work, like the air conditioners, right? <laughs> yeah, it depends on, on if we get the time use rates and things. Hopefully, it'll be set up to charge them in the middle of the night instead of um, right, right when they get home from work. But you know, people are um, animals of convenience, so it may not have an impact. Yeah, it could impact this. Significantly, you could you could have twice that growth if, if that really caught on as to how some you know it depends who you talk to also if that actually comes to fruition. Gas prices, etc. You know, um, it's a good point, good question. Uh, the study looks at it in terms of you'll see some dates associated to load growth, um, like in that in that chart there. You know, we've got okay, for example, 55 megawatts in 2029. Well, that that might not happen, and it might be quite a bit less. But the key is, is that the staff will be in tune to the actual load that's that's happening, that's being realized. And this study gives it an ID, gives everybody an idea of, okay, when that load comes on, what needs to happen? There's a path forward. Um, you don't have to do this at that time, and then wait another year or so before assessment is done. So, yeah. So that's it's a good point. It's a good question. But on the flip side of that. There's solar and there's everything is appliances uh -huh. and everything else are fuel efficient now also and going to get more fuel efficient. But that won't change and energy efficient. That won't change the delivery from the substation to a business or your house. You know, you still have to have a way to get that electricity from where it's generated to where you're going to use it. But it would still be a load on it or less load coming in, right? The problem is that it's not less load in the system. So it's it's sometimes, still electricity. Sometimes it is. If the sun is shining, it is for yeah. If it's sun, sun oh, is shining and the mean. panels yeah. on your roof of your house, mm -hmm. if it's coming from a community solar garden, we still have to go through the same wires to get to the people that need it. It's another good point, though. I mean, a, a large influx of solar generation would present some other challenges outside beyond what the load growth model that we looked at. So. Another good point, it's one of those deals, um, if it really catches fire like the electric vehicles, could be a lot of technical challenges in addition to just infrastructure upgrades. Um, yeah, so it, it's a good point. But yeah, there, you did mention like more fuel, uh, energy efficient appliances and things. So yeah, there's more uh, LED <coughs> bulbs, for example. Um, what happens generally though is more of those go in uh, than the old incandescents. It, it kind of almost balances out. So that, that is a good point, though, I guess. Here is a uh, electric, electric system map, uh, again, kind of through the GIS that we developed with the staff here, um, of where in meetings we did decided where there's the highest probability of some of this load going. And uh, you'll see kind of some of the larger bubbles up in the northwest part of the system. Um, we have some existing plants, large industrial loads that have the obvious capability of adding um, facility space, adding equipment, adding production. Um, but by and large, what we've kind of, um, what's been indicated to us and what we probably agree with too is the load is going to be probably centralized more in the northwest portion of the system, in that industrial park area. So as I just kind of mentioned, the, the timing of these projects is more based on when the load is realized or when the immediate load is, is ready to be added. Um, 
uh, load flow analysis that we do based on this projected loading and the existing peak is based on uh, we do analysis we and we d have a design criteria we try to meet that uh, I'll discuss here in a second um, gives us an outline of for what to pursue in an electric system when load is added and uh, in different configurations that a system needs to be ready for so uh, there's four criteria criterion um, that we try to uh, meet and one is uh, in the rel reliability side n minus one contingency you lose any one piece of equipment you need to be able to back that piece of equipment up in an efficient and reliable manner um, we need to maintain a certain voltage level it's consistent with ANSI standards, with industry standards, in certain voltage bands that are uh, likely to fluctuate in that event. So um, if, a feed, if you need to back up a feeder in the system, it needs to be able to provide the same voltage that it can in its normal state uh, during the back feed emergency situation. We also keep in track of the thermal capacity of the electrical equipment. So how heavy is equipment being loaded and are there any red flags when it's overheating or potential to, for example, transformers rated for a certain KVA power usage. Um, conductor, underground cable, they all have certain capacities. You exceed the recommended capacity, you either uh, there will be an equipment failure or there will be a uh, loss of expected life on that, that equipment. Also, the fourth criterion here is you want to have some flexibility. So you, you don't want to necessarily have to do a project every time you add load. You want to be able to handle that. <coughs> you do a project, you're set up for the next five or so years. You want to be ahead of it, uh, more cost effective, um, timing wise, scheduling things. It's, it's more efficient way to operate the system. Here's a uh, diagram helps put into the some perspective the voltage scenario um, we're dealing with the basically the primary distribution system from the transmission down to the, the the transformer so beyond that is somewhat um, more more finite uh, but what you can control as utility is what's on your primary distribution system so that's where the voltage um, voltage levels and the capacity is, is monitored and reported on in this study. Transformer at the house. At Transformer time. at the house, yes. So in to develop the analysis and we use software tools uh, this is the most efficient means to go about uh, cramming out calculations across the system. Um, do our load flow modeling, voltage and capacity analysis and uh, different switching configurations in this windmill software, which is uh, derived from the GIS system that you guys have uh, in place. Uh, we look at, with the existing system, we, we, like I had mentioned before, we look at the existing peak, but also in 20 years, what is that, how does the system handle that load? And also, another kind of more basic uh, assessment of the just overall age and condition of equipment. Uh, looking at how old things, when were, when, was, when were facilities constructed and how long can we plan on these being there without being replaced. And also kind of an overall picture of the transmission supply in terms of uh, how new ohm is sourced and how we can kind of uh, harden the system or make it more reliable. So for the transmission system, it's just give a brief, brief overview of the equipment if, if you're not familiar with some of the nuances. Um, transmission facilities that are owned by New Ohm is uh, 69 kV rated with um, <coughs> ties to Excel Energy's facilities on the west side of the river and the east side, uh, the Fort Ridgely sub on the east and the west New Ulm sub on the west side, all kind of in the northern part of town. So. The, the electrical tie-ins are on the north side of the town, and so we'd consider 
the system currently in radial configuration. Um, about six and a six six point seven miles of infrastructure that you guys own. Um, most of the transmission facilities were in the 1980s, 1990s, in pretty good shape overall. There's some remaining original construction stuff from the 60s out there, um, but but only about a mile's worth of that. One of the one of the main deficiencies, I guess, from a physical standpoint, on the transmission system is the presence of woodpeckers and fairly substantial amount of damage on uh, particular sections of the existing system. So I'm um, actually, I'll address it a little bit later here, but in the we're in the design phase of that project that would replace the, the woodpecker damaged, woodpecker affected area of the system. Uh, the existing distribution system is in good condition. It's largely underground. There's been a big push, obviously, here as a community to bury new uh, distribution infrastructure. Um, it's, it's basically in really good shape. So uh, there's, there's redundancy and capacity f at existing peak. So our peaks that we've seen today, the distribution system is able to backfeed and have good reliability <coughs> throughout, throughout the distribution system. This is the system map here showing the um, overall system layout, I guess, that I've pointed to before. Uh, the black lines are the existing transmission that uh, New Ulm owns. The orange is Excel's double circuit line there that um, uh, transmits between the two substations. Um, and uh, the, the dashed lines on the distribution side of the of the map there is underground and the solid lines are the overhead facilities, so. Here I just kind of highlight the east source, uh, the west source, and then here's the, the woodpecker damaged area as we cross the Minnesota River there. That's the area of concern. So I do highlight also here um, the large portion of the system that's radial. Um, basically from the north part of the system up where the tie-in from the east source all the way down through the center street sub and down to the south sub in the south part of the system is all radial. So um, present some challenges if you're to lose transmission service or a transmission facility in between those substations there. That Overall, the substations are uh, in good shape. They're configured for a breaker in, breaker out uh, configuration. And they're laid out with some forethought, I guess. Substations primarily trans uh, transform 69 kV transmission voltage to the primary distribution voltage. We have the three substations. North side is uh, the, the latest built substation in the 90s. Center Street uh, has some older, it was one of the more original substation facilities installed in the 60s and 70s. And there's some upgrades here and there. And the south side sub was built in 1980. Um, the power plant houses some of the oldest equipment, some old switch gear in the 1950s, 1960s. And that's also where uh, the a lot of the generation infrastructure is uh, interconnected. So uh, there's some 2400 volt level voltage that serves the steam plant there. But there's no, no other 2400 voltage on the system. Here, here's a table of the substation capacities. Um, you can see under existing peak load, all the substations have sufficient capacity. Um, I've highlighted that after 20 years, the north side of the system with that load growth kind of as projected in the northwest part of the, of, the, uh, of the system, you start to run into the north side being overloaded a bit. Um, overall, your overall capacity is still pretty healthy. It's just depending on where that load comes in, 
is what really dictates where we have issues. So overall look at the generation capacity, um, 73 megawatts, which is a really healthy amount of uh, generation. It's all centrally located at the center street and power plant locations in the center part of town. And uh, just to just show there the, the fuel sources there. Some are more efficient than others to operate. Um, but overall, uh, quite a bit of generation capacity. Here I'm pointing out where the, uh, on the one line where these substations are. Um, the power plant there and so as we look through the analysis and we look at uh, voltage and capacity on the system developed a table of deficiencies basically so uh, in our in our assessment where are the issues when load is added so uh, under existing load conditions there's really no issues to date we have good redundancy good reliability um, aging condition is is pretty good but when we start adding the loads uh, over the next 20 years uh, as you can see here, north side transformer is overloaded. There's a, there's a circuit on the north side substation that delivers power up into the kind of far area, the northwest area of town. And that circuit runs into some capacity issues. Um, so basically when you start getting into the N minus one contingency or the loss of this piece of equipment, loss of that and having to backfeed it, those conditions worsen as, as they, as it would indicate here. Um, what happens, well, I'll just keep moving here, but. For example, for the loss of the center street transformer uh, or uh, the north side transformer bus, you run into issues of having to backfeed those areas with the use of the north side substation feeders and uh, that puts places stress on the system. We kind of looked at, okay, so we're, we're looking at 20 years, we know what the growth may be, or we have an idea, we're projecting out. Okay, so we're okay today, what about, ha what happens when we look at one megawatt, or two megawatt? We've been, you know, there's some indication out there that there's some kind of more immediate growth be expected on the system within the next five years, next two years. Um, how, do we, how does the system handle that? If it is in the Northwest area, you know, what happens then? Um, you get between zero, well, get up to a megawatt of load growth, you, you start running into some voltage drop issues under different circumstances get up to two megawatts, which is a couple businesses, depending on the size, obviously. Uh, some voltage capacity concerns out of that west circuit primarily. The west circuit in the northwest area of the system <coughs> is kind of a, it's kind of heavily loaded today. So turns out it kind of looks like that's where a lot of load growth is likely. So um, that's kind of a big driver as to where some of these improvements that you'll hear about here are coming from. In regards to the transmission system, uh, you know, you have plenty of generation capacity. So if you do lose a piece of transmission line or uh, a substation bus, you can generally handle that existing peak conditions. Um, however, uh, as load comes onto the system, it's harder to feed that or backfeed that northwest area from the center street substation from the power plant substation. It's got to travel the same distribution length to get out to that area. So that essentially becomes a concern. You, you have a lot of generation. It's fairly centralized in the middle to lower part of the system. Um, so as the Northwest area grows, that's kind of a concern there. Um, you know, we think in general, New Alm has got a lot of good industrial commercial growth. Or existing commercial and industrial customers. So we think it's really appealing to pursue a sort of a loop system 
in the long range plan. So it uh, makes sense the business level. I think businesses would like seeing that and also just kind of takes the burden off of backup generation facilities at the center and center street and power plant substations. Um, we would kind of recommend trying to go for a closed loop network because your substations are kind of laid out like that. They're kind of laid out for a, it's a breaker in, breaker out, um, bus layout with some breaker additions, some relaying upgrades, and the right transmission infrastructure installed. You can obtain a closed loop system. And that looks really good when you do have a transmission outage. Uh, you're able to, I mean, at the most you'd see a blink, but if it's a closed loop system, you're energized from two sources all the time. If, if, if a line goes down, a breaker opens, and you don't see any outage whatsoever. So as I kind of mentioned, uh, burden is taken off of generation to be there um, in a sort of a black start situation, where if you lose that north side to center street, transmission line, there isn't a black on the system. It's kind of automatically or um, seamlessly, ideally it's a seamlessly depending on the relay upgrades, um, basically no outage seen in that situation. Um, deficiency obviously is existing woodpecker damage. Uh, you guys have identified that and resources are being directed at that to address that woodpecker issue um, with the steel poles, is, which is the, a permanent solution to the woodpecker. What we found in the design phase of that is um, because of the poor soils found in that old railroad bed and through that river valley, uh, there's just very little soil boring capacity, uh, soil bearing capacity. So um, structurally poor soils that require large concrete foundations, much larger than would be typical. Um, they're increasing the estimate of that project significantly. Um, I, off the top of my head, I can't remember that cost, but we'll, we'll touch on that here in a second. Um, what we began looking at was instead of trying to cut through across the river here with some of the soil problems, maybe we look at an alternative route and maybe we combine that replacement project with uh, an alternative route that uh, aims towards the greater goal of a closed transmission system for the community at some point. Um, get to where the costs we're seeing, the cost estimates increased due to the large concrete piers that'd be required. And you can build a lot of tangent transmission line for the same cost you're putting in a couple concrete piers. So really, if you got to go, I'll kind of get into the line route there in a second, but that's what we started talking about with the staff, and uh, we feel like it'd be a, a good pursuit. Now, after the voltage capacity and uh, voltage and capacity assessment, looking at the transmission supply, also looked at just overall the age and condition of equipment. So. Uh, Things are in pretty good shape, but over the next 20 years, 20 years is a long time, and there's some equipment that needs to be replaced, likely, or, or could be expected to fail even, in the next 20 years. And so at least at a minimum, it should be budgeted for over the next 20 year period for replacement of equipment that's generally been in use for, well, right now it's about 30 years, a lot of the stuff, but in 10 years, we're talking 40 to 50 years, some of the stuff's been out there under load, being used, um, it basically exceeds what manufacturers would recommend. So at a minimum, we've kind of prioritized these projects maybe towards the latter part because there's not an imminent failure, but uh, it, it's something to plan for. Here's a summary of those deficiencies. Um, you know, there's some older oil breakers, it's older technology at Center Street, um, at the South Side substation. Um, there's some tie transformers at the power plant substation that are aging. 
they're, they're they're fairly old you know a lot of this some of this stuff is, is 50 years old today those things would be uh, prioritized more in the, the back end of this capital improvements plan so as I'm going to kind of briefly describe the capital improvements plan and capital improvements plan and feel free to ask any questions as we go through some of the numbers here and what what it all entails um, for phase one what we've identified as a project uh, in part a that if we do end up getting some load immediately in the next year or two up to a megawatt how would we handle that well there would be some voltage issues on the west circuit uh, this is basically a a band I don't want to say band-aid because it would be useful it, it's a it's hardening your distribution infrastructure you're not going to regret that ever but it, it is essentially addresses voltage drop concerns that you would have uh, on the west circuit so um, 690,000 it's basically getting you an additional feeder from the existing distribution to further out on the existing distribution So if we do see maybe two to three more businesses, which is certainly possible in the realm of possibility, in that northwest area, how would we address that? Well, uh, likely we'd need to work on adding transformer and significant feeder capacity, distribution capacity in that area. And you know, you you could uh, take the Band-Aid route, and go 1A with this plan here. Or you could start working towards getting a substation plan, and so you could you, you could actually if the northwest area of the system, if you actually put a, tra a transformer there with distribution network tied into your existing system, you would essentially handle any types of new load as projected here. So you're, you're alleviating voltage and capacity concerns over the course of this study if you start to pursue that <coughs> and you know that is more expensive it's just about six million dollars for that um, that includes a transformer it includes a new site up in the northwest part of town um, includes includes distribution circuitry tying into the existing system all that would be necessary to get a substation interconnected Phase 1C it, it consists of basically pursuing an additional terminal out of the West New Ulm substation that Excel owns. Uh, today, there is a, a single terminal that is uh, basically jointly, Excel owns the terminal that feeds this town from the West. And so you don't really own it. You can't control breaker operations on it. You, you take a, a a radial tap off of that existing line from West New Ulm. Um, this would actually pursue discussion with them talking about getting a dedicated terminal that can feed New Ulm and basically contribute towards the overall goal of having a loop system. And uh, you need this source to power the new substation essentially. Um, this would be, this would coincide with a west side substation project about 1.5 million dollars this map here um, shows uh, the capital improvements um, the red facilities here in the northwest area of a new substation distribution work tying into the existing substation uh, existing distribution network and then there's a, a short line from the existing West New Ulm sub that's orange up there, um, about a half mile stretch of line that would be needed to feed that West Side substation. How this looks on uh, a one line is again the red. Um, it includes, in, uh, you know, tying in a, from a new source from that West Side from the, the, the West New Ulm Excel station. Um, you can see the line coming into the West Side sub and we'd focus on that at this time and then eventually it would kind of contribute to the overall 
loop system. Uh, further in, into the capital improvements plan, phase two consists primarily of transmission upgrades. So once we address the voltage and capacity concerns, which are kind of the immediate concerns when you see the load, we start looking at the bigger picture reliability regarding the transmission. Well, phase 2A is already kind of in, in planning, in design. It consists of replacing the woodpecker damaged area. So that's kind of already the mode that we're going in right now. It's about, it's just under a mile. Steel poles consist of the large concrete piers, larger than would generally be necessary, but there are the poor soils crosses the Minnesota River there in a low area that floods periodically, which is why there's some silty, silty soils there. Um, one point. Consider that those piers, of, did you consider using uh, pilings for those? Yeah, we did have discussions with the staff and, and there's a helical pile system that can, uh, can address it with a, uh, some less cost. Um, some of the things we talked about with the staff was, yeah, it's a little less cost, but they kind of have, they have a wider footprint. And in the river there, you get a lot of trash. Is that an issue? Is that gonna be a bigger issue? And it's, it's kind of a different installation. It's kind of, I don't know if it's cutting edge, but it's certainly a possibility and it's something that could still happen. Um, you know, those costs have been weighed. Um, but it's not a huge reduction of cost. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so that's really, a couple hundred thousand a dollars. There's piles in this area, and it's really easy. If you can get the equipment there, it's really easy to pile. I mean, one right. stroke and it goes down like 10 feet, and we probably only got uh, 20 to 25 feet to bedrock down in the river valley. It's not really that deep. Um, so in soil or borings. At least in the area where we're at. Right. Well, so in the soil borings, they did not see, you know, bedrock at, at 20 feet. They saw mush for 60 feet. Really? Yeah, where those transmission lines are. Wow. And today, you have, they've, they address that, there's guy wires all over creation. So you go down there and there's guy wires every which direction and they're, they're shoring it up. Um, but, you know, so with woodpeckers, the wood poles, it's kind of messy down there with the down guys. So we'd recommend not going with the down guy system. Um, yeah, so the soil borings were like 60 foot of mush. And there's blow counts like less than one. And the, so that's when we really started opening our eyes like, wow, maybe we need to look at something a little different here in terms of routing. Um, the other concerns we have for that, kind of a side note, um, access down into that area to get concrete piers installed or piles is going to be challenging. It, it, you're going to you're going to be at the you're going to be kind of at the the whim of the weather really in the flood the flood level which which is all known it's a flood area there. So with all those little things going on on that project, it kind of makes you kind of ah, maybe maybe we spend a little more money, cover a little more distance, add a little bit more reliability, add a little bit more be loop potential, I guess you could call it. So phase 2B is where we again of started thinking a little outside the box. Um, do we look at constructing a tie from basically where we're going to start rebuilding on the north side of that part? Do we just, there's a steel pole there. Do you terminate on that, head down the highway, north side of the river, and try to cross the river at a little more appealing point. At least it's apparently a little easier. It's cleared out. It's not quite as low. Um, there's just a little more infrastructure there. Do we look at that? So we looked at some potential routing, really kind of high level stuff. There needs to be some additional work done on determining feasibility there, but five and a half miles you could build a loop to the south side substation. There's an there's an existing bay that's free. It's not free. Well, it's it's open. That is intended for a line terminal at some point. Do you add a breaker there? Do you bring in a source 
around on the south side of the substation. We got an estimate there at about 2.9 million. So it's about 110 percent, 100 and you know, it's twice, two and a half times what the cost is to rebuild the woodpecker area. If you look on this capital improvements map, that begins kind of where the, uh, there's a V up out of the Fort Ridgely substation, that where that black line at the top of the screen, where that V's out. So 2A would be where it goes straight southwest, crossing the river. That's, that's what we're rebuilding today. That's been in the works there. Uh, 2B is coming down the highway, looking at feasibility of that, and coming in around the south part of town. Um, it's quite a bit more distance, but after looking at the eventual costs of the woodpecker rebuild, it's worth a look. How that looks on the one line is the green. Uh, you can see the, the configuration there. It's not as meaningful on one line, but Phase three consists of basically completing the loop. Once we get phase one and two done, then you're kind of tying in some loose ends. You're, you're getting pretty close. You have a physical loop for the most part with the exception of an additional tie to the existing north substation, the line feeding the existing north side sub to what would be the, the west line, what we, we could call it. So you're basically tying in, you're connecting a loop around the whole system. There's some breaker upgrades, there's some relay upgrades included there. Um, about a million dollars more after the, the heavy investment, then you're getting close to that closed loop system. Phase four of the capital improvements plan is um, age and condition updates. So these are things that in the next 20 years, these things are getting, these facilities are gonna be between 50 to 60 years old. So it should be budgeted uh, to some extent in this plan. Just things to look out for. And those are things that in the last half of the plan, maybe the last 10 to 20 years, is where these items are addressed. It's not an immediate concern, but they're things to be accounted for. So you'll see the purple here. Um, there's a small area of the existing 1960s uh, transmission line there. That's it's, it's not a concern right now. It's not an issue, but 20 years it may be. And then at the the power plant, there's old switchgear there from the, some of it from the 50s. Some of it's been retrofitted. Um, there's a lot of old electromechanical relays in some of these locations that are 30 years old, 20 to 30 years old. Basically all the purple is stuff that in the next 20 years needs to be accounted for to some extent. And here's kind of a tabulated view of this capital improvements plan here. Um, any questions on any of this costs, any of the staging of the projects? So at the end of the day, um, there's a lot there. We recommend starting some discussions with Excel to see if this is feasible. You know, if this is something that jives with what your guys' vision is, um, these are our recommendations. Uh, we and the staff given some serious thought to how we can configure things, not just how much can we spend, it's more how smartly can we spend it. You know, instead of the woodpecker, the kind of the band-aid fix there, do we think outside the box? Um, you add some lo load in the northwest area of the system, that's where the concerns <coughs> are, the voltage capacity, <coughs> voltage and capacity basis. So, and there's a few, you know, there's some research. It's not for certain these things can happen, particularly we're dealing with an outside, en outside entity like Excel. They serve you your power now, but, um, you know, at West New Ulm there, what is their plan? Is, is it feasible on their end? Is it possible? 
Uh, there's some costs there. We've tried to capture some costs and contingencies and whatnot through here, but recommend starting to talk with them. So, any questions? Seems like not. All right. At any time, feel free um, to, to reach out for those questions. Or a million bucks a year. Mm -hmm. a million a year. <coughs> okay, thanks very much. All right, thank you. <coughs> For today, we want to receive the report. Okay. I can make a motion to receive the presentation on Noam's electric system study and 20 year capital improvement plan by Jared Lutz. Luzi. Luzi with DGR Engineering. Second. Any discussion on that motion? On the motion and second to receive the presentation on Newham's electric system study and 20 year capital improvements planned by Jared Luzzi of DGR Engineering. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Post same sign and the motion carries. Uh, next we have a proposal from DGR Engineering. <laughs> <coughs> um, yeah, this is um, a feasibility study to do what I guess we uh, staff has taken the calling the end around approach, which is one of those last slides there on the transmission going around somewhere around the 20th Street lift station coming back in and tying to the south side substation. We have actually put the current woodpecker project on hold to see if anybody's interested in researching this. The woodpecker project originally was budgeted at 650000 and now it's in excess of 1.1 million. We felt that uh, maybe putting on hold and then pricing in some other options to check off more of our needs rather than spending this kind of money and still only getting status quo may be worth investigating. When you start looking at it's a third of the project and you still have all these other issues, why not at least consider maybe to quote Jared thinking outside the box a little bit and knocking two or three off. And one thing we should mention, if we would go ahead and build that transmission system around the end, we would not rebuild the woodpecker portion that we currently have. So we decommission that segment of line. So their 20 year study would be reduced by 1.1 or 1.2 million by not doing the wrong project or the temporary project, however you want to put it. If you have any questions, I'm sure Chad and Jared could answer some more too if you're. And the price on this for eight to $10,000, looking into it, maybe doing our due diligence, I guess. So staff is b basically recommending that you pr proceed with studying phase, what is it, phase two option? B. Yeah. Questions, thoughts? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. So I will. Uh, move to authorize the city manager to accept and sign a proposal for development of the feasibility study of options to rebuild the east side transmission line from DGR engineering at an estimated cost of eight to ten thousand. I'll second. Is there any discussion on the motion? We have a motion and second to authorize the city manager to accept and sign the proposal for development of a feasibility study of options to rebuild the east side transmission line from DGR Engineering at an estimated cost of $8,000 to $10,000. All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Uh, motion carries. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is to consider approving a grant proposal from the Nuam High School. Good evening, Derek Nelson, Energy Services, Services Representative. Um, 
So as President Heine mentioned, I'm here to talk about a grant that the Public Utilities uh, offers. And uh, New York Public High School recently applied for that grant through the New York Public Utilities. The grant offered by the uh, Utilities is the Energy Education and Research Grant. The submitted application is requesting $4,000. The money requested will help educate students on renewable energy, specifically solar energy. If the solar installation application, which they need to submit yet, and uh, this grant are approved, students will begin next school year with a curriculum. The educational experience will include the implementation of the NEED Energy and Power curriculum. Other possible curriculum may still be included are Solar Energy International's curriculum and Sun Power. Currently, this grant is not budgeted. <coughs> nor has it been budgeted in the past, as far as I can tell. Um, it is staff's belief that the funds for this grant have been pulled from different conservation improvement program accounts, such as the miscellaneous education and the school education program. Within the CIP accounts, there is money available and our solar rebate program, which has been discontinued. This program was budgeted last year and has now been removed from the CIP as a rebate. The solar rebate program is currently the only account that I can see within the CIP that can withstand an unexpected expenditure of this amount. So this is um, something that I was unfamiliar with when I started, so it came to my attention when the public high school submitted this, this grant. Um, as far as I can tell, the money requested was suggested by their vendor, possibly uh, leftover money to pay for the installation of the solar panels, possibly. Um, but <coughs> attached, I have our application, which they technically didn't fill out, but they submitted along with it a, a good application, which was, I believe, the Independent School District 88 Foundation um, application that they had sent in to them for approval for money as well. And kind of to summarize the multiple sections of that application, um, the curriculum and the goals of the installation of these solar panels uh, is based on showing students um, career and technical opportunities, you know, management, conservation, and efficiency production of energy that is currently present in the real world. And I think their ultimate goal is to get their greenhouse that they have at the public high school hooked up to the, these solars and have a whole curriculum kind of intertwined together. So that's the best of my knowledge. I have tried to contact them on a few different um, occasions. They've gone back to me on a few things, some other things they did not. School is not in session. I'm not sure how, some, how long some teachers are in and out of their classrooms in the summer. So. So I'm just curious, Eric, ha have we done something like this before? Yes, um, I believe this um, grant was started in 2007 or 8, and I think since then I can find one proof of one conversation about it from the public high school and possibly a second um, with the putting green <coughs> when it began. But that's about the only proof I can find of. So it's like 4,000, the ma like the max. There is, there there is, is no, no set maximum amount. Okay. But ultimately, you're working with your, within your budget, is what you're saying. Right. Within the overall budget, not for the specific grant, but within your overall budget that we are expected to spend on. Because you have reduction. the money available yeah. through that. You can find the money, money available in the solar rebate, which th when this was bu when that was budgeted, when it was still a rebate, was ten thousand yeah. dollars, which technically is just will sit there, yeah, and be allocated to different accounts, I suppose, at the end of the year if something would be short. And there's ten thousand in there now. Correct. You're saying, yeah. I think it would be a nice nice fit i know they've had to do fundraising for that greenhouse right. and solar is a big thing that they want to do with some of the classes be, and even the four thousand that they're asking for um if it was to pay out, pay for it was technically is it i don't know if this grant is meant for that i'm sure with supplies and everything it'll be used up quite a bit because the teacher who sent this 
um, application and I mean, it'll be through grades <coughs> 9 through 12, <coughs> roughly 220 some students, so. Mm -hmm. I think it's a $22,000 project, so they've fundraised, it, they've, they had another mm -hmm. grant or fundraised to the rest of it, so it's a correct. nice yeah, mix At least funding. from their estimate they gave me was, yeah, correct, $22,000. Mm -hmm. It is something that maybe if we have a grant, we should be publishing and there should be opportunities for other entities to apply that would be interested, but. It needs to be discussed and whether it needs to continue, and if it is, mm -hmm. to budget for it, put a maximum amount on it, or if so, or. Mm -hmm. Yeah, correct. I'll make I the motion. Okay. Motion to approve the Energy Education and Research Grant of $4,000 to the New Ulm High School. I'll second. Any more discussion? On the motion and second to approve the energy education and research grant of four thousand dollars to New Elm High School. All in favor? Indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, the next three items I think will are IT issues. Yes. Yeah, good evening, Commissioners President Heine. Um the first item I'd like to uh, have you consider is um, the renewal of our uh, license for our antivirus software that we use on our computers and our servers here. Um, in the past we had a three-year light. We didn't do a three-year license. We did a year-by-year <coughs> -year license um, <coughs> and uh, the opportunity came up to do a, a three-year renewal and uh, uh, we've been happy with the performance and functionality of the current software and <coughs> I'd like to uh, uh, have you approve a uh, three-year renewal for that license. Move to authorize the purchase the ESET antivirus three-year renewal from SHI in the amount of $2,520. I'll second. Any discussion? On the motion and second to authorize the purchase of ESET antivirus three-year renewal from SHI in the amount of $2,520. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Yeah. Next, I'd like you to consider uh, approving a three-year uh, service agreement for Proofpoint Essentials. Uh, this is our uh, email security software. Uh, it <coughs> scans all email that's coming in uh, before it comes to our systems, um, scans for viruses, spam. Um, when you look at the uh, staff report and you look in the IT section, that's where you get a lot of those statistics for uh, you know, the amount of spam that's removed and blacklisted and whatnot. Um, we've been very happy with this product. Uh, we had it, we've renewed it twice for one year uh, s uh, increments, um, and we'd like to recommend uh, renewing that for a three year uh, subscription at this time. I'll offer the motion to purchase Proofpoint Essentials three year service and support subscription for $10,350 from CDW G. I'll second. Any discussion? On the motion and second to purchase Proofpoint Essentials three-year service and support subscription for $10,350 from CDWG. All in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Uh, that motion carried. Okay, the third item I'd like you to consider is um, a, uh, a purchase of a three-year license for desk, uh, Manage Engine Desktop Central. Um, this is actually an upgrade from what we currently have and this is this is probably the, of the three things This is probably the one thing I'm most excited about because uh, this is a tool that IT staff use every single day throughout our day um, This is a tool that saves us a great deal of time because it helps us manage all the workstations and servers uh, Right from our computers rather than having to go around to each one individually uh, Which was what we were doing prior to uh, this you know, get putting this tool in place we needed to do Windows updates, we went to each single computer to do those updates. Uh, this tool has saved us a tremendous amount of time. Um, you'll see in, uh, in the uh, item that I submitted for this that uh, uh, we are currently on the professional version of this tool. The enterprise version gives us a number of additional capabilities that we don't have today. Um, the hope is to save us even more time, uh, specifically with uh, deployment of new computers and uh, with when we have a computer that does have issues, to be able to uh, push uh, um, a new image of that computer out without having to uh, rebuild the computer, so to speak. You know, when, when a computer gets, I don't know, when it gets so uh, 
when there's so many issues with a computer that you have to reinstall Windows, uh, this sort of tool, the capabilities of the newer tool allow us to push out a new copy of the computer, essentially. And there's some additional functionality as well. Uh, this is also a three-year uh, license uh, so that uh, we don't have to keep renewing it as well. I'll make a motion to purchase Manage Energy Engine Desktop Central three-year license for $8,577 from SHI. Second. Any discussion on that motion? On the motion and second to purchase Manage Engine Desktop Central three-year license for $8,577 from SHI. All in favor, indicate by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Uh, finally, is uh, <coughs> um, we need to consider a list of claims paid and to be paid. I'll make the motion to accept the list of claims paid in the amount of two million one hundred eighty-five thousand two hundred thirty-seven dollars and eighteen cents and approve the list of claims to be paid in the amount of $366,734.72. I'll second. Any discussion? On the motion and second to accept a list of claims paid in the amount of $2,185,237.18 and to approve the list of claims to be paid in the amount of $366,734.72. All in favor, indicate by stating aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Unless the commissioners have any comments, uh, we are adjourned.